Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Association of the United States Army's Institute of Land Warfare Global Force Symposium and Exposition. I will say that 4,500 people participated in day one events, and uh, from everything I'm hearing, to a very good effect. I'll also announce that the walking challenge yesterday was won by Bonnie Mikorski with 20,683 steps. Let's give a round for Bonnie. Now, she's in charge of the security detail here at the BBC, so you have to feel pretty good that she's out doing her rounds. If you catch up with her today, please give her your congratulations. Today, we have a, another great agenda with panels from the cross-functional teams for future vertical lift and the Army Network, also an NCO panel today, several Tech Tens from our industry partners, and don't forget the Warriors Corner in the Army booth, all their presentations planned for today, and the Innovators Corner in East Hall. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Lockheed Martin for their generous sponsorship of the coffee service we're enjoying this morning. Can we have a big round of applause for Lockheed Martin, please? So we have another full day of professional development and networking, and we're going to kick off this morning with a keynote presentation from General Gus Perna, the 19th Commanding General of the United States Army Materiel Command. Please help me welcome General Perna to the podium. So, General Christian, thanks for that uh, introduction. Yesterday I was uh, at a lunch and I saw General Christian for the first time in about a year and I walked up, I said, hey ma'am, how's it going? How's Leif? How's the family? And she says, I really wish you'd start calling me Pat. And I said, yes ma'am. <laughs> uh, it's just indicative of the great leadership that continues to support our Army uh, through AUSA remarkable example for all of us. Great leader, great intellect, great person, and great friend. So thank you very much, General McQuistian. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we must challenge and change status quo. Not to change for change's sake, but why we must change to maintain our edge against a dynamic and always changing world. I want to talk about how the great leaders have, have changed by challenging status quo and facing reality. I want to talk about what we must do through steadfast leadership, a community support, strong partnership with industry, and timely and consistent funding from our Congress. But before I do that, I want to thank AUSA and General Ham, Sir, another great event. We're only on day two, but clearly productive. My time on the floor yesterday was very exciting, but rewarding. And I thank you for the venue that you and your team put together. How about a round of applause for AUSA? <laughs> yesterday, we had a great uh, opening comments by our Secretary of the Army that provided the vision for us, but then it was enabled by our Under Secretary of the Army who's here, Honorable McCarthy. Sir, thank you very much for your leadership. His battle buddy, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, was with him, and we're going to hear from him shortly. Together, these two are leading the change, the vision from the Secretary and the Chief, and we're remarkably grateful for your collective leadership. Thank you very much. I'd also like to express my sincere thank you to the industry partners that are here today. The time, the effort, the money that you do place into this capability, this, this venue, is incredibly rewarding for all of us that need to build partnership capacity, for those of us that want to build relationships, for those of us that want to talk reality. This venue is exciting. And when we come together on the floor or in the hallways, we should always be frank with each other and understand the facts and the assumptions and build the relationships that are required to move forward. 
Because without industry, we will not be successful. And we all understand that, and we want to say thank you for what you do. We could not do this, though, without all the general officers, flag officers, senior executives, our great DOD civilians, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardmen. And last but not least, our DOD civilians that work every day so hard to do what we need to do as a country to protect, to serve. So thank you very much. Why must we change? One of my favorite quotes comes from Sun Tzu. If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear a hundred wars. The U.S. Army currently enjoys an overmatch based on a qualitative edge in capabilities and capacity. And we've had this overmatch for decades. Our soldiers and equipment gave credibility to our efforts, and they did this against quite a foe. We have earned the respect of our enemies. We have deterred their actions through our presence and our capability and our capacity. And they knew, our enemy, that we could execute. And they knew we would be supported. And they knew that the industrial base would keep us sustained as required. Our systems enabled us to defeat enemy formations. As the Secretary talked about yesterday, in Desert Storm and OIF, we went through the fourth largest army like a knife through butter. That does not happen by accident. Our Army's capabilities continue to serve as a critical pillar to the joint force. The best has always gone forward. But the problem is we have not significantly modernized since the 80s. And we need to understand that. Our Army has spent the past few years fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting a foe, and we have been victorious because of our efforts, because of our science and technology, because of industry support, because of our great soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, because of our leaders, and because of congressional support. But times are changing, and we must change. The necessary emphasis on those missions, combined with constrained or limited buying power has been a problem and will be a problem. It has slowed, deterred, and at some times eliminated our ability to modernize for the future. Meanwhile, our peer competitors are not so constrained. We must challenge and change status quo. That's what our message was yesterday from our leaders. We must embrace this message and move forward. First, we have to know who the enemy is. In the Far East, expansive territorial claims combined with multi-layer anti-access aerial defense systems have challenged the freedom of navigation. Not since World War II have we had this challenge. In the Middle East, rogue nations continue to pursue ballistic capabilities, weapons of mass destruction, and cyber weapons. They are using both conventional missiles and state-sponsored terrorism to impact our strategies. We see competitor nation military modernization efforts like never before, expanding nuclear capability, clandestine operations that disrupt our way of life. One can easily speculate that these nations are directly trying to deter what we believe and our way of life. And they are doing it through expanded moder modernization. We must challenge and change status quo. We must do it today. We know our environment. We know that warfare has changed. We heard General Abrams talk about it yesterday morning. We know that the past ways of thinking, organizing, executing are inadequate and will not serve us well in the years to come. 
today we're not worried, but it's tomorrow we must think about. When you look at the emerging concepts, doctrine, and capabilities of our peer competitors, especially in the cyber world, you will see they are concentrating their efforts, their efforts to deny our ability, our ability to both project our military power and to conduct integrated joint forces operations. And the industries that support them are integrating technology and capabilities into military systems at a much faster rate than we are. Fact. We exist in an environment where peer competitors are trying to out-innovate us every day. And right now, we are not postured for success. We must challenge and change status quo. To understand where we must go, we must first look back at what happened. Our history will quickly validate the vision of our leaders. In 1940, a modernized German army swept across Europe. They did this because in the 30s, while everybody was accepting status quo, they were modernizing equipment and tactics. The armies of Europe were overmatched and unprepared. The United States, at the time, we were ranked the 18th army in the world. Primarily, our equipment was of World War II, or World War I, excuse me. Our equipment and our training had not advanced into the future. Our defense industry was largely non-existent. So when asked, General Marshall responded, we are not ready. We do not have the capability or the training or the equipment to execute a world war. Status quo, status quo had failed us. The president called upon friends from the business community and explained the situation. One name from the community came forward. William Big Bill Knudsen. Knudsen was the president of General Motors and knew everything about manufacturing. More importantly, he knew everything about mass manufacturing. Knudsen left GM and moved to Washington and began coordinating modernization arm, uh, efforts for the United States. He called his friends in corporate world and got them talking to the generals and admirals. In short, he got everybody rowing in the same direction. That is what the Secretary and the Chief are doing for our Army right now. They are setting the priorities and moving us in the right direction. And they want to do it with industry. In March 41, President Roosevelt signed the Land Lease Act. It enabled us to execute massive production, but at the time, only for our allies. As a result, we went into World War I or II moving. We were at least crawling, able to walk and run exponentially. As you know, the industrial base was challenged after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. We had just started. We weren't ready. You have seen the pictures, the factories, the shipyards, the workforce. Industry challenged and changed status quo, converting themselves to execute to our requirement. Thanks to Roosevelt and Knudsen, the friends of industry, we have been successful. We were successful. They challenged and changed status quo of the manufacturing base. During the entire war, we produced more than two-thirds of the equipment for the Allies. During this time, we produced 86,000 tanks, 2.5 million trucks, and a half a million Jeeps, 8,800 naval vessels, 5,600 merchant ships, 2.6 million machine guns, 41 billion rounds of ammunition. That's what we were able to do. The question is, are we ready to do that now? If required, if our nation is called upon to execute, 
Can we do that now? And more importantly, will we be able to produce what we require to compete and defeat the Army of the future? Knutson had four basic premises. First and foremost, he believed in innovative and productive companies. He believed that it was not just the traditional companies that would make us successful. It was those that saw themselves as creative and industrious, that allowed their people to be innovative, not just the normal. Second, and this is important, he asked the military to resist dictating everything to industry. Knutson wanted a bottoms up, not top down way of doing business. He wanted the full power of the commercial markets to enable our capability. He wanted industry to be unleashed. Third, Knudsen created an entirely new workforce. Uh -huh. An entirely new workforce. Ensured that they were well trained and incentivized. And fourth, leadership. None of, what, of this would have been possible without the integrity, determination, and persistence by leaders from government, the military, and industry. Businessmen, politicians, generals, and admirals had to talk and move forward together. There was no room for parochialism. Underpinning all of this was relationships. That's what venues like today are about. Relationships, building them, not being afraid to speak truth, holding people accountable, expressing visions, allowing people to see behind the curtain so that we can create the innovative process that we need, so that we can ensure that the people that are required to support us are trained and incentivized. So we can focus ourselves on what the requirement is and not necessarily the sustained status quo. Today, we operate within a bureaucracy of complex rules and regulations. We took Knutson, what took Knutson weeks takes us months. What took him years takes us decades. It's shameful what we've come to. We must hold ourselves accountable to break the bureaucracy, to change status quo. We can only do this if we are upfront and honest with each other and we understand what each of our priorities are. This I find incredibly frustrating as a senior leader in our army. But this should really scare you. Our enemy is not constrained by our bureaucracy or our funding. Our enemy is producing innovatively to defeat us on the future battlefields. So the question is, are we going to admire the problem or are we going to do something about it? I would suggest to you, starting last October at AUSA, when the chief and the under announced their vision for Army Futures Command, and yesterday when the secretary, under, and vice led us through the conversation and defined the future they are not admiring the problem. They are rolling up their sleeves. They are giving us the priorities and the funding, and we are moving out. We just need to come together and do it together as we move forward. What does this mean in simplest terms? I want to break it down for you. This past weekend, I was walking with Susan out on Redstone Arsenal. And we saw Little League practices and soccer practices starting up. We looked over to the field. Our first comment was, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> the second comment was, hey, look, think about this, hon. Those are five, four, five, six, seven-year-olds. In 15, 20 years from now, those children from Alabama, Pennsylvania, Kansas, will be serving in our military. 
across our military, not just the Army. But they will be the young men and the women that have to execute our tactics and, more importantly, use the equipment that is there. If we don't take the time to modernize our force, you know what we're going to have? Those five-year-old children manning our tanks 15 years from now, and they're going to be manning their tanks against an enemy who might not even be in their tanks because they're pursuing autonomous capability, because they're pursuing a capability that will outreach ours, both in munitions, communications, and visually. We cannot allow this to happen. We must make the decision today to move forward. Admiring the problem will no longer be successful. If we do not challenge and change status quo, we will not be successful. So what are we going to do today that will impact tomorrow? First, we must understand the past, as we've talked about, the present and the future. We must think deeply about how we will fight in the coming decades, not today, the future, and how our enemy will fight. We must think deeply about how we define our requirements and then how we're going to sustain that capability on the future battlefield. Second, the window to act is now, not tomorrow, now. I strongly believe that the next two or three years are going to impact the next two or three decades. That's the influence that we must have. The ultimate consequence of our actions, or more importantly, our inactions, right now, will be measured on how many lives are saved or how many lives are taken. That is our responsibility. The time to gain the competitive edge and that overmatch we talk about is right now. And the people to provide it are right here. Nobody else. It's us. Third, as the leaders, we must be aggressive. We must drive to the future, challenging and changing status quo. Our enemies will not give us time. They will not give us a pass for what we failed to do. They will take full advantage. We are weakened by our bureaucracy, but we can lead our way through it. The path to successful modernization was made clear by leaders like President Roosevelt and Bill Knudsen. I say the Secretary in the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army are doing the same, enabled by our under and vice. And we, the leaders, the community, the soldier, sailor, airmen, Marine and Coast Guards, we have to execute now. The same will occur today, the same processes of today will not be effective in tomorrow's world. The problem is, if we wait for the incident to occur, we'll be late. That's why change is so important today. Their vision, the Secretary and the Chief's vision, is taking us and Army Futures Command forward. It is about challenging status quo. It will give our soldiers a decisive advantage on future battlefields. The Army Futures Command is all about denying current capability and future capability, both in space and on land. Army Futures Command is all about creating decisive advantage, but more importantly, creating enemy disadvantage. The Army Futures Command is all about changing status quo, not for change's sake, but why we must change to maintain our edge. That is Army Futures Command. As an Army senior leader and commander of Army Materiel Command, we are ready 
to challenge and change status quo. We are in full support of the Secretary and the Chief's vision. We will execute violently. We will be in full support of Army Futures Command. Army Material Command will continue to serve as the Army's senior logistics and sustainment headquarters in support and responsible for integrating, synchronizing, and echeloning transportation and logistics for the total Army. We will do this in partnership with Army Forces uh, Futures Command. Army Material Command will stay laser focused on achieving the Secretary's and Chief's priorities and maintaining and executing the COCOM Commander's requirements. Together, together, the total Army, steadfast community support, congressional support, industrial support, and coupled with the vision of our leaders and supported through resources and time, we can accomplish this. We must accept this challenge. We must stop admiring the problem, making excuses. We must move forward. As I've told the leaders in Army Material Command, do anything we need to do in support of the Secretary and the Chief's priorities and the COCOM Commander's requirements, I have one piece of guidance. That is to move forward. No excuses, no reasons why. Move forward. And we are in full support of execution. Our efforts today will ensure the battlefield of the future is to our advantage and to the enemy's disadvantage. And this is my challenge to all. So General Ham, ladies, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. And with General Ham's permission, I'll be glad to take a couple questions. Army strong. Okay, so first question. Uh, Gus, do you really believe in Army Futures Command? <laughs> hey, it's a great technique. Do what your boss tells you to do. Uh, hey, look, it's, uh, I really, uh, with all my heart, and those of they, you that know me, believe I speak with passion uh, and it's the New Jersey slash middle linebacker in me that drives me uh, to what I believe has been my success. Um, and I don't say things because I have to. I say things because I believe in them. We clearly have to move forward. Um, not to overuse the statement in my speech, but if we are afraid to challenge and change status quo, we're not going to be successful. I think Army Futures Command is about being bold and innovative. I think it's going to provide us agility. It's going to be, allow us to be adaptive. It is about giving us the advantage uh, and the enemy the disadvantage. And I believe this. I believe the ability of the Secretary and the Chief to reach down to one commander and say, I need the force modernized, will have exponential success. It will allow ForceCom to focus on training and readiness. It will allow Army Materiel Command to focus on sustainment and logistics. It will allow TRADOC to focus on recruiting, training, and educating. In itself, the simplicity is brilliant. The challenge will be in the execution. It will require the right vision, leadership, resourcing, and time. But my belief is that the benefits of this command will be uh, very powerful for those five-year-olds that are on the baseball field today. So that is my heart, and that's where I'm at. Uh, and I'll be prepared to answer more questions as we go forward. So how will the Army balance internal AMC depot support versus contracting out to industry 
future requirements. So what we're working on right now is a balance. What I believe in all my heart is that we need commercial industry capability and we need the organic industrial capability. Right? We're not to separate them, but we are to work as partners. They should be integrated in their capability to the output we need for the Army. Not based on profit, not based on workload, not based on keeping people's jobs, but on the output that we're trying to achieve. And what are we trying to achieve in simplest terms? It is ensuring the equipment readiness so that our soldiers have confidence in it when they most need it on the battlefield. So they can train day to day with its full capability and capacity and then execute when time comes. That's our responsibility. I personally believe we have our metrics wrong. I believe in the organic industrial base, we man it or we manage it based on workload and in simplest terms, keeping people employed. In the commercial industrial base, and this is my personal baggage, uh, cynical as it might be, it's all about profit. I think we need to combine the two capabilities. We need to understand what we're trying to achieve, and then we need to integrate and synchronize those capabilities to that output in simplest terms. I think it can be done. I think if we change our metrics and we hold ourselves accountable and we resource in it, accordingly, we can have the best fleet of equipment in the world. And more importantly, our soldiers will be confident in the equipment. In order to be confident in the equipment, they have to be able to use it in training. If the readiness rates don't allow them to bring the equipment out to train, how can they have that confidence? In order to make it to where we need it to be, we must fund it and resource it to the output we want. We need timely and consistent resourcing. We need to focus on the metric of output. And if we do that, we can live together, we can have a balanced approach, and it can be very effective in our output. So, I know there'll be problems on that in the hallway. So, um, how, can, uh, how can the industrial base get ahead of the curve with the Army Futures Command. So one of the things that the Secretary uh, and the Under have challenged me with as my responsibility as for logistics and sustainment is to make sure that the CFTs are integrating logistics and sustainment early in their decision-making process, not at the end. And so I work horizontally through the six CFTs, six plus two CFTs to ensure that they are thinking about this capability. What we need to do is come together, the industrial base and Army Material Command and ASALT in executing this. It'll be the collective partnership, the three legs on that stool that will ensure that the sustainment and logistics of the force is thought about early. So, how can the industrial base help? Partner with ASALT and AMC as we move forward not just in the modernization of equipment, but how do we figure out how to logistically support the equipment on the battlefield. You heard General Abrams talk, one of our great war fighters yesterday. He started talking about repair parts and components and fuelless tanks, right? When the senior maneuver commander in the United States Army starts talking like that, I don't have to say anything, <laughs> right? Because you know what the importance is then. But that's how we can partner and move forward together. Okay, uh, General Ham, sir, I think that's about it. If there's anything else? Okay. Thank you. Gus, no kidding. Do you think Army Futures Command is? <laughs> Okay, the question is, is um, where do I think uh, the future generations, millennials, fit into the Futures Command? 
The generation has been raised in a world of constant disruption and ambiguity. How will leadership engage these individuals to shape our future force uh, and fight? Um, I don't know, it is a challenge, but I've been in the room. I've heard the guidance from the Secretary, the Chief, the Under, and the Vice. We are looking for something different. We understand, the, well, we believe we understand the capability and capacity of the younger generation. We have a lot of confidence in it. Now, how do we bridle that to what we're trying to achieve is to be determined. I think we have to challenge status quo and more importantly, change it in the personnel system is our number one requirement. We will not be successful in bringing in this generation if we use the archaic uh, and antiquated process of hiring people into our force right now. It's absurd. It's World War II-esque, and it is not going to be successful. In order to modernize through Army Futures Command, we need to modernize our personnel system. We need to be aggressive, we need to hold ourselves accountable, and we need to be open for difference. We cannot, in my opinion, hire ourselves. We have to hire the anti to us. We have to hire those who have the courage to challenge our thinking, to those who have the intellectual capacity to be in the realm of cyber, those who know and live it comfortably. We are uncomfortable, so we don't accept it so easily. Our challenge, and we've got to stop admiring it because that's what we're doing right now, is to stick a grenade in the personnel system and change it. That's number one. Number two, we have to put leaders in charge of the command that will be reasonably acceptable to the thoughts and ideas of these people that we bring in. Number three, we need to change the way we do money, both by annual funding and through the POM. It's archaic. It will not allow us to be innovative, adaptive, or agile. And so what good is having a person that has a new idea that could come to fruition very quickly, but yet it's constrained because our thoughts, our funding was designed five years ago? Or we have to go back up and ask permission this year to change. So three things, personnel system, leadership, money. That's what we need to change. So General Ham, thank you very much, sir.